Good afternoon, comrades. It is our pleasure and our honor to receive our guests tonight and to receive all of you in this space. Many of you I know. How many of you have been in the People's Forum before? Okay, some, so some of you all are family. How many of you have never been to the People's Forum yet? Anya, you, you've, your visit has been delayed. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> but there are many people who know who we are and those, there are those who don't. But we are a movement incubator, a space that's dedicated to creating community, that is dedicated to creating the space where activists and organizers engage in political education, to engage in culture, to engage in media work, as a way of advancing the working class struggle in this country and internationally. We emphasize the international because part of what we do here is to not separate the struggles of the poor and the dispossessed. The unity of our class, the unity of working people across the planet is essential to the vision of this space, which is why it's not strange for us to receive our Venezuelan comrades again I don't know how, I've lost count how many times you've all been here now. <laughs> but each visit, each time is equally special. Because they bring to this space a voice that is constantly being silenced in this country. How many of you all have heard about the sanctions against Venezuela? Well, this is a friendly crowd. <laughs> but sadly, that is not the reality of the country we live in. We live in a country that is hurling, hurting, and killing slowly in what has been an act of collective punishment against the people of Venezuela. And most of this country is silent. We're here tonight to give voice to the concerns of the Venezuelan people, but also to share what is our collective responsibility in this time of crisis, in this time of difficulty. We want to welcome to the panel, our dear friend, ambassador to the United Nations, comrade Samuel Moncada. We want to welcome Claudia de la Cruz, who's director of culture at the People's Forum. And our most honored guest tonight, it's hard to call him foreign minister because I see him as a true comrade. I feel like he's more our foreign minister, not just of the people of Venezuela. So we're honored to have here dear comrade Jorge Arriaza. It is also an honor for us to say that we have the vice minister for North America here, our dear comrade Carlos Ron. And the, rest, and the rest of the dedicated staff of the Venezuelan diplomatic mission to the United Nations, which has bravely stood up to the worst of the empire and to all their lies and all their attacks. We're also honored to have here activists from across the city and across the country. It's particularly poignant here that we have a special guest who came all the way from the Dominican Republic, Matias Bosch. Just a day ago, we commemorated the anniversary of an invasion, a military invasion by the US against the people of the Dominican Republic in response to the people who rose up lifting the name of his grandfather in struggle. So we're honored to have his presence here tonight. And without any further ado, we want to invite our dear friends from Venezuela to tell us, in the best way possible, how are the sanctions affecting the people of Venezuela? This is an opportunity for all of us to take notes, to get as best acquainted with the situation on the ground, and to arm, with, arm ourselves with the truth. Fidel used to say that it's, the truth is, cannot just simply be the truth. It has to be told. And our responsibility is to come out of here with that knowledge to take out to the streets. So, dear friends, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. 
Gracias. Thank you so much. It's been quite a long day today, but we are very happy to be here. You know that we love and respect the people of the United States of America and all the migrants as well that are part of the people of the United States of America. And uh, we believe that, as a matter of fact, you are the first victims of the empire that is uh, ruling, the elite that is ruling this nation since a very long time. And we know that you will change things sooner than later for the well-being of all the humanity. So thank you very much for being here. What's this? We forgot to mention a surprise. Is that a secret service? No, no, no. We forgot to mention a surprise. I, I suppose this is because our friends in the building of the Venezuelan embassy are connected, no? Are they? Yeah. <laughs> Where are they? There? Hello. Hola. Gracias. Thank you so much for protecting the Venezuelan territory. Okay. That's a great surprise. But I guess before you told me. <laughs> so today we we were at the UN headquarters and we were able to there was a press conference, and we were able to explain not only the people, the, 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 the journalists, the reporters there, but our people in the first place, the Venezuelan people, and all the peoples of the world, the effects of this blockade. Because they are, the blockade is based upon sanctions, but sanctions, punishment, who can punish whom? Is the government of, does the government of the United States have any kind of faculty, legal faculty, or of uh, morality in order to sanction another country? Does the government of the United States have the faculty to make people suffer because they want to make their will happen? In, in another country, you know about all these regime changes, no? way before Second World War and after the wars, it's especially all over the world, but especially in Latin America and the Caribbean. Every single country has suffered or either an invasion or a coup that has been promoted and funded by the government of the United States. Not by the people, I insist, but by the elite that rules in Washington. As I said before here, the president of Bolivia once, Evo Morales, joking maybe, said that the only reason why there hasn't been a coup d'etat in the United States, in Washington, is because there is no American embassy to the United States. No? <laughs> and it's a joke, but it's true. No? But it's not only in Latin America, it's in many places in the world. But especially Venezuela. Now, why? Because we have the largest or the biggest reserves of petroleum, of oil, in the world. And uh, also, we have gas, we have gold, we have silver, copper, coltan, bauxite, iron. Well, we have water. I mean, it's a, a wealthy country. Nature, privileged, Venezuela. But also because there is a political um, process happening. It has been happening for almost 20 years. There is a revolution. A revolution that became a socialist revolution because of the pressure, because of the attacks of the United States government. Because in principle, at the beginning, Comandante Chavez didn't consider himself a socialist. He admired the socialist revolution in Cuba and the Chinese, but 
He even said several times that he was looking for a way in between socialism and capitalism. And he talked about, was this prime minister from uh, the UK? that Tony Blair. Tony Blair, no, the third way, no. But then he began, when he took, he and the government and the Venezuelan institutions took several decisions, issued, passed bills, laws that gave power to the people, that took um, power from the, to the, uh, out of the bourgeoisie. Of course, when, when the, the people, the governments in the capitalist world understood that Chavez was going seriously to give power to the people, then he began to receive attacks. I remember 2001 after the terrible terrorist attacks here, 9-11, you know, then the war against Afghanistan began. Although the terrorists were originally from Saudi Arabia, but the Taliban and the Afghanistan people were blamed, and then the Iraqis as well. No? They had no connection with the attacks, but they were blamed. So I remember that it was like a consensus. A consensus, you know, everyone was agreed about the fact that the United States was attacking some terrorist countries to prevent another attack. And Comandante Chavez, in an address to, to the Venezuelan people in television, he said, I agree that we have to fight against terrorism. But, and then he showed the pictures, the photographs of b Afghan babies dead, killed by the bombs. No? And he said, I agree, but not this way, not like this. That day, he began to receive attacks, aggressions. Everything began since then. Because before President Clinton, he had this policy of, he, he, he actually said it, or, or someone in his, his Secretary of State, he said, we, the policy with Chavez is wait and see. Because we were waiting. Chavez traveled to, the, to New York. He was in Wall Street. He hammered this thing in, in, in Wall Street and he, Pitch the first, you know, the, the first uh, uh, pitch of of of, uh, of uh, I don't know if it was in New York or somewhere else, but of the big leagues, you know? the mayor leagues, and he, and you no, know, they tried to convince him, but they couldn't. You know? So they were waiting to see if they could convince him. So finally, they couldn't. And all of this, and that same year, two thousand and one, uh, the uh, President Chavez also with the National Assembly after we, we had the new constitution that was voted and was, was written by the people. Um, then he issued the first bills, the first laws, you know, land reform, um, even the hydrocarburates, you know, the, the petroleum, everything. So then now the state had the majority you know, of the profit and, and the, of, of the ownership of, of everything. So then everything began. You know. So. In 2004, after the coup, after the sabotage, after the aggressions, after everything, the George W. Bush was the president here. So Chavez said, our revolution is anti-imperialist. And uh, in 2005, he was convinced that the only way that humanity could prevail was socialism. So he said, our revolution is anti-imperialist and socialist. But he said, it's a different kind of socialism. It's not the European, it's not the Soviet socialism. It's not the Yugoslav socialism. It's not the Cuban, the Vietnamese, the Chinese. It's our sociali socialism. Democratic socialism, ours, no, it's our model. We c you cannot import socialism if it's real. No. You cannot export socialism if it's real. Each society, you, know, you, you have a, a basic agenda up in, upon which you agree. You know? Free education, free health, um, uh, welfare, 
healthcare, I mean. But of course, um, uh, there are differences between the systems, among the systems. So that is why. But why did it happen it's so fast, maybe? Because he felt that capitalism was after the Venezuelan people. I mean, many people ask, why do the Venezuelan army, the armed forces, why is our equipment and our weapon system Russian and not American? Well, because in 2001, once again, the government of Clinton, no? No, Bush. Bush already, yes, Bush in 2000, the elections. They decided to cut all the military cooperation with Venezuela because they already saw, no, this wait and see, they saw and they knew. So they said, no, we cannot help this man to have a powerful army. So he has F-16 planes, which are American, and, and tanks and uh, rifles and whatever. And uh, he's going to, this, everything is going to uh, be damaged because there will be no maintenance, there will be no parts, uh, no renew. Uh, so they believed that immediately Chavez said, well, if the Americans won't help to protect my people, then I have to look somewhere else. And Russia was there. And we have a very good relation with Russia. Respectful relation. They don't impose anything in Venezuela. And of course, we cannot impose anything in Russia. But uh, we have military cooperation, but we have industrial cooperation. We have uh, minery cooperation uh, and many other fields. But it was because of that. That is, you know, then ma many things happened in Latin America this, the first 10 years of, of this century. You know? In Brazil, Lula, in Bolivia, Evo, in Ecuador, Rafael Correa, in Argentina, the Kirchner's, in Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega and the Sandinistas, in El Salvador, um, where else? Um, of course, Cuba now was stronger because we should say we have a very good cooperation with Cuba and they needed the Venezuelan help, and the Venezuelan oil. So we exchanged oil for lives because they sent doctors and they sent people that helped the Venezuelan people. No? And we paid for them, but not with money, but with oil. No? So suddenly, Mr. Obama was concentrated on the on these uh, uh, wars in the northern Africa and what they did, Libya, Syria, all, all that disaster. The, it, Iraq and Afghanistan are not issues that have been solved. No? He was concentrated there, and then when he turned his attention to Latin America, he said, wow, what's happening here? This man Chavez, and uh, now the, in Cuba, it's not Fidel, it's Raul, but he's strong, and the Sandinistas are back, and the Frente is back in El Salvador, and these m people in Argentina say they are left, uh, leftists. So what, what, what can I do? So then they began a new policy to regain governments and to regain spaces, political spaces, and they have been successful until, until, until some point. How do they do it? What happened in Brazil? There was a coup. It was not a military coup, but it was a coup. And it was promoted by the United States. What happened in Ecuador? What's happening in Ecuador? No? Once again, when did this president, Lenin Moreno, change his position? After he received a very important citizen of the United States, whose name is Mike Pence. No? And he immediately changed positions. And he called the IMF and asked for a, a new agreement, etc. And now he's after President Correa and his people. No? What uh, happened in Argentina, the, the, the President Macri was his campaign. He has a lot of money, but he had all the support and the funds from the United States. So they had a strategy in each country. And... Uh, What's, what's happening in Venezuela then? No? We've, we've been under sanctions for, formally, for three years, but really for <laughs> many years. And uh, you hear, you, you have a big debate, this Mueller thing, and, 
and uh, about if the Russians intervened in the electoral campaign or they didn't, or they did, they didn't. We have had uh, intervention from the government of the United States for 20 years, not doing the electoral campaigns. Every single day, every single week, every single hour, every single minute, every single second. No? And in Latin America, that happens every time, uh, all the time. But in Venezuela, it happens every single day and hour. No? So what's, when Comandante Chavez passed away, he was a great leader. No? Uh, we have to recognize. <laughs> and it was difficult for the Venezuelan people because many in the world thought that our revolution depended only on his leadership. And that when he was, that's why they tried to kill him before. And who knows how he got this strange disease, this cancer. Because no one in his family and his grandfathers, and no, there's no kind of medical precedent of this cancer, such an aggressive cancer. But okay, let's consider that they, this was biological, natural. They thought that being Chavez away, then this was going to be something very easy, no? To topple or to or to win an elections, no? Funding the opposition. So they, and especially because they said, well, this Maduro, man, He's a bus driver. Huh? He, he, he doesn't, he ha has no money, no? so uh, he's not Chavez, he doesn't have the Chavez leadership. So this is going to be a very easy task. And they have tried, by all means. They tried, the, there's, there's a, an integral war, warfare against Venezuela, but there's a communication, a mediatic, a information warfare against Venezuela. You know about it. If you watch CNN or NBC or Fox News or Euronews or BBC, whatever you go, it's a dictator. He's, he's worse than Saddam Hussein. He eats children for dinner. I mean, this <laughs> Maduro. Um, there's an economical warfare. No? But all these so-called sanctions, the blockade. There is a political diplomatic warfare in the OAS. Andy knows about it. Um, she's very brave, muy valiente. Gracias, Andy. And uh, in the United Nations, they are trying to make this procedure happen, to challenge the, uh, the uh, credentials of our delegation in the General Assembly, and they are pressing countries and all the U.S. ambassadors all over the world, but I'm, I'm not saying in Brasilia or in Berlin only, no, no. In Vanuatu, in Fiji, in Namibia, in uh, the little islands of the Caribbean, they are very active. They, are, uh, they go every single week or every single day to the ministries of foreign affairs to press them and to tell them, if you don't recognize this other man, this other fellow that says to be the president of Venezuela, then I'm going to cut this cooperation program, or uh, you, you won't have any funds for this or for that, or I won't support you in this decision that you need to make, or I'll tell the IMF not to sign the agreement with you. They, they are, that's extortion, no? And they are pressing hard. We've, we know because these countries tell us. They won't go public, they won't go, no, but they tell us, hey, they, they're pressing us. For instance, today we met with, with this important group of uh, delegations from over 60 delegations were there. And in, in the meeting they say important things, some of them. There are others that are sitting there and they want to say it, but they won't because what if he tells the Americans, what if, and uh, from the those that are uh, brave il enough in order to speak there and independent enough, so there's, there's a group that 
will not go public, will not say it on, on the television. They are brave in the corridors of the United Nations, but they cannot be brave no, on camera. So what's happening is that they are exhausting all the options. No? Th this Mr. Trump and Pence and Bolton and all our friends say that uh, um, all the options are on the table. It's a very weird table, no? because the option of dialogue is not on the table. The respect for the Venezuelan Constitution is not on the table. Respect for the UN Charter is not on the table. Dialogue from Caracas to Washington, with Washington, is not on the table. Uh, facilitating a dialogue between the Venezuelans, among the Venezuelans, is not on the table. The only options on the table for them is, or Maduro leaves, or we make him go. And we will make him go by any means, including a military operation, including an invasion. And that's what's happening at the moment. No? This, they had a plan. Last year we... I, I've told you this before, but as a summary, last year we, there was a, even before in 2017, November, uh, we had a dialogue process happening in Dominican Republic. President of Dominican Republic was a very good host. Former president of Spain, Zapatero, was there with us. Some ministers of foreign affairs were there. So finally we reached an agreement. These people wanted presidential elections before the, what the Constitution says. No? They wanted elections in 2016, 2015, 16, 17. So we said the, the year that the Constitution says that the elections have to be held is the last year of the mandate, which was last year, 2018. And they, are usually, they usually happen at the end of the year, October, November, December, usually even in, in December. So we said, you want elections in advance? Okay, let's, let's do them in advance. Let's do them in March. And the Constitution said, no, we don't want elections in advance. Okay. You've been asking for elections in advance for three years, but now you don't want them. No. Of course, they were defeated. No? In the, by the, they, they went to the streets with political violence. They killed people. They burned people alive. They set people on fire. They destroyed the public property and, and private property, and uh, they were defeated. Then we went, then President Maduro solved that situation in, in 2017, conveying elections for the National Constituent Assembly. And they thought that the Venezuelans would not vote. They thought that only one million or two million Chavistas would vote, and eight million Venezuelans turned out and voted uh, in spite of the barricades, in spite of the violence. <laughs> And then, then we had uh, we hold, we held the um, gubernatorial elections, and all the opposition participated, and they lost 19 out of 23 states. No? And then we had elections for the the municipalities, and they, some of the parties did, they didn't register because they didn't want to lose again the opposition parties. So we won 300 out of 335. So. They were politically defeated, so now they didn't want the elections. They wanted more time. And so finally, uh, we agreed April. And they said, OK, April. So um, we had a very complete and uh, um, integral agreement that had to be signed last year in February. Do we, a new kind of a relation in which the National Assembly and the National Constituent Assembly would recognize each other and work together. We would come to Washington and ask the government of the United States together to lift the sanctions against Venezuela. We would uh, begin the process to name uh, the, the new um, members of the Electoral Council, the the Court of Justice, or everything. It was a very good agreement. So every, everything was set. And th at the last, when I, I'm not saying, when I say at the last moment, it's not the day before or the morning before. At the last moment, when they had to sign, they appeared there in the hotel in Dominican Republic, and they said, we are not signing. There's no agreement. 
We, we really didn't understand at the moment what's happening. Then we understood. They had activated this plan and they received an order from the United States. That same day, Rex Tillerson, the former Secretary of State, was in Bogota with the president, former president of Colombia, Santos. And we know they had a conversation with the opposition delegation. So they activated this plan, which was, we will not take part, we will not participate, we, we will not register for the elections, we will say that the, the elections are going to be a fraud in advance. The United States government will say the same, and the Colombian, and the Chilean, and Argentinian, and the Canadian, and whatever. And uh, we will not recognize the results of the elections. And when, it when the time comes that Maduro has to be sworn, inaugurated as president, we will say that he's not the president, because there were no elections. And now the new president is going to be the president of the National Assembly. And the Constitution says that the, if this were to happen, if, if, if Maduro had disappeared, if the elections never happened, no, and something happened to, even if the elections happened, but something happened to the elected president before the inauguration day, then the Constitution um, um, provision says that the, um, the president of the National Assembly would be in charge of the presidency of Venezuela for 30 days, and uh, uh, during those 30 days, he had to not only convey, he had to do the elections to elect a new president in Venezuela. But of course, Maduro is there. There were elections. There were fair elections. There were observers. Uh, he won. Uh, the opposition had an important candidate. He was not supported by the, the other parties. He, had, he was a very bad candidate uh, in, in practice, no? He, he, his campaign was very bad. So finally, he only had two million votes. Uh, President Maduro had six million votes. A new man appeared who is Christian, evangelic in Venezuela. He had one million votes. So finally, what happened is that, yes, January the 10th, Maduro is sworn for his new mandate, his new government. And they say, no, he's not the president. And Mr. Pence says, no, he's not the president. And Mr. Duque in Colombia says, no, he's not the president. And the European Union meets and says, we're not sure if he's the president or if he's not the president. So, okay, then everyone was expecting this man, Guaido, who many people in Venezuela are still learning to spell his name. <laughs> uh, nobody knew him before, no? really, really, because he's not one of the leaders of the opposition. He's a new, a new one, a, a new boy in the family of the opposition. So... But he didn't. He didn't dare to do it, or he didn't have the strategy. And it then w it was 13 days after that, you know, the 23rd, uh, January the 23rd, that he suddenly, in a rally, in a demonstration of the opposition, they make demonstrations all the time. He raised his hand, opened his fing fingers, I don't know why, and he self-proclaimed as president of Venezuela. I am the new president of Venezuela because there were no elections, and, and the Constitution says so. So it was ridiculous, no? It was like a joke, but it's not a joke when the United States government is behind him. Yeah? So five minutes after that strange situation, Vice President Pence tweeted, uh, the new president of Venezuela is this young man, Juan Guaido. And then the president of Colombia, the president of Chile, the president of Argentina, this very good president that they have now in Brazil, and all these people. <laughs> and, so, and then that evening, President Trump, he tweeted, no, the new international document no, for, the for the international relations is Twitter. No? <laughs> so President Trump tweeted, I recognize uh, Juan Guaido and Bolton tweeted and he spelled the, the last name of Guaido wrong. He put guiado. No, what does guiado mean in, in No, no, he put guiado, the sentence. Guiado. No? Guided. Guided, guided, no? Guided. no? He recognized he was a guided. <laughs> so he for for this crazy scenario of, of the of the opposition, it it's laughable, but it's sad at the same time. So this man said he was the president. Okay, so now what? He has no control over anything. No, he doesn't control 
not even the National Assembly. He doesn't control a police patrol or an ambulance in Venezuela, but he says he's the president. But then they went with this issue of the humanitarian aid. And uh, President Trump is such a good man. He's so worried about the Venezuelan people. He can't sleep at night because he, the Venezuelans are starving because Maduro is such a bad man that he sent some humanitarian aid to the border, to Colombia, to the border. And uh, they were um, gathering all this, all this uh, uh, aid there. And then Chile and the president of Chile sent the humanitarian aid. We, our economy is, is not in, in a good shape. No? We have challenges. We have hyperinflation. And uh, sanctions have made a lot of damage. But we don't, we don't have a humanitarian crisis. No? But what happened in the Dominican Republic a day like yesterday, no? in 1965, against Juan Bosch? They said there was a humanitarian crisis in the Dominican Republic. They went to the Organization of American States. Then they had the support of all the governments, and they decided that there was a humanitarian crisis because they didn't like President Bush. And uh, they sent two doctors, three nurses, some boxes of uh, medicine, and 8,000 Marines. Hmm? 42,000, right, but the first day was 8,000. <laughs> and they did what they, they invaded, and they took control, and they Im imposed a dictatorship for years. You know? That's what they're trying to do in Venezuela. But, and they really thought, you know, all the messages from Bolton and from Pence and were directed not to the Venezuelan people, but to the Venezuelan military. You, Venezuelan military, are supporting the dictator. You, General Padrino, are supporting the dictator. You have to support Guaido because well, I don't know why. And, and then they really believed. First time I met with this good man, Elliot Abrams, <laughs> he was convinced that there would be a military coup in Venezuela. He was convinced. And I told him, it's not going to happen. You don't know our military. No? No, it's a, OK. Why don't you come to the right side of history? We will protect your family. What are you talking about? Huh? OK. So next time when I met with him, the second time, the first one was uh, February 26th. No, January 26th. The next one was February 11th. And uh, I told him, Mr. Abram, your coup didn't happen. It failed. And he said, I don't remember if it, the exact words were this, but he said something like, OK, I, I accept it, so now we're going to make your economy collapse. And at some point, the suffering of your people will make this regime change happen. You know? That's what he said. Yeah? Carlos was there. Yeah. Samuel was there. And that's what they are doing at the moment. They were very frustrated February to 23rd when they did, when the coup didn't happen, when the militaries didn't turn their back against President Maduro, when they couldn't make these um, trucks with some boxes f being forced in Venezuelan territory. And uh, they even burned, set on fire one of the trucks, and they said it was the National Guard with tear gas. Huh? And uh, it was them. And then they, yeah, we knew it was them. Telesur knew it was them. But when the, the, the public opinion of the world believed finally and were convinced that it was them when they read in the New York Times a couple of weeks after. So they were frustrated. It didn't happen. But now they are pressing governments. So it's this, um, as, as I said, um, war on communication against Venezuela, a war, uh, economic warfare, a diplomatic warfare, and the war itself, it's happening. I mean, they are funding militaries. No? They are paying militaries to betray the Constitution. That we had one here in Washington, a, a colonel. No? And uh, he was here for many years. And you know why? Because usually the military at the chess, the, the time they stay in the place is 
couple of years, then they, then they rotate, no, they are changed. This man had 10 years here, you know why? Because he had cancer, no? Cancer? Tumor, uh, brain. Brain, brain, tumor. M brain tumor. So our military decided that he must stay in Washington in order to have his medical treatment guaranteed here because his doctor was here. So that's what happened. We paid him a good salary in dollars for 10 years for his medical treatment, and suddenly he recognizes Guaido and he says Maduro is a dictator, and he betrays, and he was paid. Because we are not paying him. How can he live in, the, in Washington if he has no salary? Huh? And it, in, it, for instance, it happened in many places, but our military attache in Brazil, in Brasilia, he was invited by the military at the chair of the United States to a meeting. And once he, he, of course, he asked for permission. And once he attended, he was there. Someone entered and said, the two military at the chairs were sitting down. And he said, I am, I don't remember his, it was a Latino name, Pablo something. I am an agent of the CIA. And I know that you have a house in, in, Las, in Vargas, the state of Venezuela. I know that you have uh, two cars. I know that you have some money in Venezuela. I know that your daughter wants to study uh, some kind of career in the United States. I know everything about you. And whatever you need, we will give it to you, but you have to pronounce, you have to say that the new president is your commander in chief and uh, betray Maduro. And of course, this man who is very Chavista, reacted as he had to. And uh, when he began to tell him, you are crazy, Maduro is my uh, commander in chief, he's my president, I will never betray my people, what are you doing? You will not um, buy my, my consciousness. And everything then, this man said, stop, General. I knew you were going to answer like this, because I, we studied your profile. But you have to understand me, I'm doing my job. And we're doing this all over the world with all the uh, Venezuelan military at the chest and inside Venezuela. So please don't get angry at me, I'm doing my job. No? They, they had some 200, I mean. We have the members of the National Armed Forces, the officials and troops, professional troops, the figure is 2,000. I mean, 215,000 um, members, you know, men and women. And we have the militia, which are more than 2 million. No? So we have 2 million, 2,015 men and women. And they convinced 200. 200. What's that? What's the percentage? What's the 0 0.1 something? No? So the coup didn't happen. No? But they insist. No? They insist. And uh, you know about this meeting in Washington recently, thanks to the Gray Zone, Max Blumenthal, we got to know that there was a meeting, how do you call it, this tank, think tank? CSIS in Washington, 40 people attended, or at least were on the list, some Venezuelans like the ambassador of Guaido to the United States, no? the new ambassador of Guaido to the OAS, because he had the help of Mr. Almagro, and Mr. Brownfield, you know William Brownfield? No. Don't you don't know him? No. He's a very dangerous man that used to be ambassador in many places, Venezuela. in Venezuela as well, Colombia. and Colombia, and he knows a lot about Latin America and how to, he's like Elliot Abrams, but younger. No? He's a new generation of Abram. And uh, who else was there? Kirk Kirk, no? yeah. um, the former uh, Kirk, the the former commander of the South Command. Yeah, yeah. No? So there were militaries there. There was the ambassador of Colombia to Washington was there. Uh, some man from the Brazilian embassy was there. And uh, s uh, many, who else from the Americans? You say. The USAID, the State Department, National Security Council, Juan Cruz, Ruz, from the State Department. Oh, he used to be 
And you know what this meet? Huh? National Security Council. At the NSA. You know what the meeting was about? The modalities of military intervention in Venezuela. That was the only topic. Is it going to be the Marines? Is it going to be the drones? Is it going to be through Colombia, using uh, Colombian paramilitaries? How will we invade Venezuela? That was the only topic. And this happened 10 days ago. Hmm? And they accepted when Andia and other um, journalists have uh, asked them to their face, did you attend this meeting? They say, yes, we did. And this man who says to be the Venezuelan representative to the Organization of the American States, he even said it was a good idea because when your uh, country is under uh, the rule of someone like Hitler, then you have to use your friends and you have to use all the options, including the military option, to liberate your country. These people are crazy. So what happened during these four months? We not only maintained control of the state and the institutions, but we even regained political power. Many Venezuelans that last year were frustrated because of the economic situation, some of them didn't even vote in the election. Some of them voted for other candidates, not for Maduro. Now they ask for their weapon in order to defend their homeland if there is an invasion against Venezuela. <laughs> and these months are dangerous. No? I must accept it. Because next year, it's, you have elections here. No? And President Trump wants to be re-elected. And there are many others, Republicans and Democrats. So it's a strange democracy where only two parties can have access to the presidency. And you have to have a lot of money in order to do so. No, here I don't believe that a bus driver can become a, a president in, in the United States. But we respect the system. No? Um, that's none of our business. But we know that next year, if we resist and we protect our people, next year they are going to concentrate on the national issues here for the campaign. But remember that in order to become president of the United States, you have to win a very important state, which is Florida. No? You know that Florida was, at some point, there's an island there called Amelia, and uh, the Simon Bolivar sent, I don't remember the year, 1823, 18, he sent a, expedition. an expedition, and they took control of, of Amelia, which was under the Spaniards, you know, the, the Spanish Empire, and they declared the independence of the state of Florida, well, not the state, of Florida as a country, as a nation then. And the Spanish had no power in order to, you know, to, to reverse that situation. You, you know who <laughs> sent troops and gave Florida to the, Spanish, to the Spaniards again? The government of the United States. Now they sent some uh, troops and then they expelled the Venezuelans and the Colombians from there because I mean, it was the, the, the Colombian, the big nation. And, and uh, they gave it to the Spaniards again. No? So they need to win Florida. And uh, in order to do so, they need the Cuban-American vote, the Latin-American vote, which is you know, the majority of, not all, but the clear majority of the people there, and, and the power and the economical power is within these communities. And the best campaign they can do is attack Venezuela, attack Nicaragua, attack Cuba. So it's dangerous because how can you justify a war or s a blockade against a, a peoples and making people suffer and people die if only to win a state to become president or to be re-elected re president? No? That is so unfair, but it's happening. So, in, it's, it's, I'm talking too long. <laughs> Today, we showed this document. This document was published 
in the web page of the state.gov, no, the State Department, yesterday, but they disappeared today. It's some of some media, American media, took it and it still you can find it. But it was erased. It was <laughs> they turned down. It was in, took it down. Took, they took it down today. Why? When we saw this yesterday, we said, God, this is unvaluable. This is gold for us. Why? Because it's a fact sheet of the U.S. actions on Venezuela. April 24. The United States policy on Venezuela is focused on ensuring free, fair, and transparent elections that bring prosperity and democracy back to the people of Venezuela. And, and then they began to list hmm, the actions they have taken, the sanctions, no? the executive order, uh, 13,692, what happened, executive order, mm, the Kip Nim, King Ping Act Authority, the executive order, another executive order against uh, the Venezuelan gold industries, the, what has happened in the Amer uh, organization of the American states, they recognize it's an action of the United States, not of the states. Of, of the member states. What happens in the United Nations with the Security Council um, meetings, they also say it's one of the actions of the United States. The Lima Group, no? Th the, the government of the United States formally doesn't even belong to the Lima Group, but the Lima Group is an action of the United States, so this is a confession, <laughs> no? Uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, you know that they recognized, within this, this bank, they recognized the, the, this fake government of Guaido and our people were expelled. So that is an action of the United States government. And then, this is very interesting, key outcomes in 2019. First one, Juan Guaido announced his interim presidency under the Venezuelan constitution in general. So that's an outcome of the U.S. actions this year. Second, 54 countries have recognized interim president Juan Guaido, another outcome of the United States action. Interim president Guaido appointed 36 country and uh, three institution representatives. On February 5th, the U.S. Chief of Protocol received Carlos Vecchio's credentials as appointed ambassador, and then Trump received the, uh, the credentials. Look at this outcome. More than 1,000 members of the military have re recognized Juan Guaido as the interim president, defected from Venezuela and are now in Colombia. U.S. refiner Citgo is now under the control of the interim government. That's an action, that's an, an outcome of the actions of the United States this year. Roughly $3.2 billion of Venezuela's assets overseas are frozen. That's an outcome. And it's not really 3.2, you have to update, Carlos, you have some contact with the Department of State, update the figure. It's almost six billion euros, not dollars, that are frozen for medicines, for food, for uh, everything we need. They are blocked no? in banks or in Europe, in the United States, in Asia. Look at this outcome. Venezuelan oil production fell to 736 uh, thousand barrels per day in March, less than half of the production in March 2018, and substantially reducing revenue to the Maduro regime. So that revenue is not for the Maduro regime. That, many, that revenue is the central income of the Venezuelan state in order to buy food, to buy medicine, to build houses, etc., etc. So they are happy because this is happening. No, an estimated. 25 crude oil tankers with 12 million barrels remain stranded off the coast of Venezuela due to difficulties finding buyers. Reportedly, PDVSA is offering a 25% discount on the stranded crude but require purchases, purchasers to loan within port. The interim government continues to provide humanitarian assistance to the Venezuelan people. I don't know where that is happening, really. Well, and diplomatic pressure resulted in fewer markets for Venezuelan gold. That's true, uh, but not really diplomatic pressure. The sanction that the U.S. has issued. And uh, a United Arab Emirate bank called the purchase, canceled, sorry, the purchase of Venezuelan gold, and there are indicators, indications of gold exports to Turkey have fallen. 
So these are the outcomes. They are happy because our people is suffering. They are happy because there are children that have to have a surgery and there's, there's not enough uh, material in the hospitals in Venezuela because our money has been blocked. And I have a, one example which is like symbolic. This is, how do you say factura? A receipt, a bill, I don't know, from PDVSA. One, two, so it's PDVSA paying for something. No? In, it's in Italy. Three. And this, when you sum, when you add all of this, it's the the amount is four million eight hundred fifty one two hundred and fifty two euros. What's this for? It's uh, the beneficiary of this is Associazione per il Transplanto di Medulo Osseo in Italy, which is the transplant bone marrow transplant, bone bone marrow marrow transplant. an institution in Italy. Pedevesa has a agreement with them, and because we don't have this kind of uh, medical technology or practice in, in Venezuela and in most of the countries of Latin America, they don't have it. We send these patients to Italy with their family, with their mother, father, and we pay for not only the surgery, the transplant, for the treatment, and for the family to stay with them. And to, oh, it, this, this can take two years, three years, until they recover. So there are 26 Venezuelans. I have the list here. No, I won't say their names, but it's the names and last names, but it's Miguel, Rebecca, Nauri, Pedro, Oriana. Miguel is 20 years old, Rebecca is 22, Nauri is 30, Pedro is 24, Oriana is 15, Moises is 8, Claudia is 17, Samuel, Samuel is 17. Um, Carlos is five years old, Marcelo is 53, Daniel is 53, Salvatore is 35, Jose Tang is five, uh, or is that his last name? Jose is 58, Rosandra is 34, Vicenzo is 57, My Walida is 55. This is 16 out of 26, the list that we have, there because they have been visited. And these people can die in the following days because what this means. When I read this, you see here, Manuel, cuenta, nombre del beneficiario, it says, Código de Situación, Code of Situation, cancelada, cancelled. First time, we try to pay, and the bank in Portugal, which is the intermediary bank, said, no, we can't because of the sanctions on this and that. So they gave us the money back. We were paying through PDVSA, no, through this used to be paid by CITGO, which is the Venezuelan company that has been confiscated by the communist government of the United States. Because only communism confiscates. Okay? <laughs> but then we tried to pay it. CITGO couldn't pay because now that money is for the bourgeoisie. So it's $30 billion, CITGO, the assets of CITGO, the value. So we try to pay through PDVSA, and they say no, because the sanctions against PDVSA, okay, let's pay through Bandes, uh, Bank, Venezuelan Development Bank. And when we try to pay through Bandes, they not only said that it couldn't happen, finally, they have the money blocked. This almost five million euros are blocked in Portugal. Hmm? There's a list of uh, banks here, somewhere here it is. I used this material today. This is Venezuelan money that has been blocked uh, in different banks of the world. Huh? In England, the Bank of England, it's Venezuelan gold, but it is the value of that gold is one billion, one point three billion dollars, one point one billion euros. No, um, Citibank here in the United States. I have no money to pay the ambassador, his salary. I, I have the money in, in Venezuela, but I can't make the money um, be deposited here in the United States, be received here by a bank because of the sanctions. And my people in the embassy have six months without salary. Hmm?
But we don't only have a company that has been confiscated, but we have $196 million in the Citibank, and we cannot use our money to pay our people or to buy medicine or to buy food. In some bank called Clearstream London, this is uh, bonds, it's 453 million. And there are many other banks. In Dubai, North Capital, 235 and 38, only almost 239 million. Novo Banco, Portugal, 1.5 million, billion, I mean, euros. There is the money here in Portugal, is the money for these people in Italy, the, is the money for our embassies in the world, is the money for medicine, the money for food, the money, como se dice las cuotas, the payments no? of the UNDP, of the World uh, Food Organization. Quotas? Yes, yeah. quotes, the, the quotas, quotas, the payments, the quotas. So I told Mr. Guterres yesterday, no, the Secretary General of the United Nations. I have the money. Uh, well, I don't have the money now because it's blocked in Portugal. But I paid for the um, world, the FAO world? World Food Organization. World Food Organization. Yeah. Yeah. The world Food Program. No, that's a World Food Program? No, the World FAO? Food and Agriculture Oh, yeah, Food and Agriculture Organization. I paid, I don't know, eight million, I believe, or seven million dollars, but the money is blocked. So he said, well, we have to look for a solution, we have to look for a waiver, whatever, but now we cannot vote in this institution because we didn't pay, actually, no? And this is going to be happening with other, with other uh, uh, agencies of the United Nations and with the UN itself. Next January, we will have to pay 30 million, something like that, which is our annual uh, quota and uh, how c how will we do it? So we're working, trying to work with the United Nations and telling them this is not our fault. This is something you have to help us uh, solve. No, but then we have uh, here 415 million in some Sumitomo Bank in Japan, and uh, the total amount in dollars is 5.3 billion, 4.6 billion euros. This is money for my people and it's blocked. There is a report that was issued today. For by, it was written by two American researchers, Mark Weisbrot and Jeffrey Sachs. No, we didn't know about it. We, we Today, we, it's this one? Yeah. Oh, you're updated. I haven't read it. I haven't read it. But they say, no, they, they, that sanctions have uh, resulted in at least 40,000 Venezuelans that have died, mm -hmm. at least. I, I really don't know the source of the information. I have to study about it, but that's their opinion. But they also say, uh, one of the conclusions, that if there were no sanctions against Venezuela, the Venezuelan economy would be in a much better situation and shape. And uh, we wouldn't have all these hyperinflation issues in Venezuela and whatever. So that it, those are facts. No? This is a letter from one, two mothers of two of, the, of these patients that are in despair because th they, they can be expelled from the hospital in Italy because we haven't paid. No? Some friendly NGOs are trying to help and see what they can do. We even talked with the Bank of the Vatican. Mm -hmm. hmm? in order to find a way to pay for this. We don't have an answer until now. But these are facts. This is happening. And this has to be stopped. We have to stop two things. And with this, I'm going to stop talking. The war against Venezuela, uh, the on Venezuela. It has to be stopped, because it is an option. And they did this meeting to study the modality of the invasion. So it, this has to be stopped, and uh, the American people can stop that in the streets. No? As, you, as you have stopped.
As you have stopped the U.S. government using the Venezuelan opposition to take control, take over our building in Washington. No? And I'm, I appreciate <laughs> all that mm, Code Pinks and others are, are doing there. And once we stop the war, and we, many, many in the world are helping, no? many, not only governments, but social movements, and uh, many people, many people that are organized. The uh, Assembly, International Assembly of the Peoples that was created recently is, is organizing also. Th we are, uh, from today, we are declared that we are uh, going to denounce this, and that we are in a campaign to stop the blockade against Venezuela. It has to be stopped because people are suffering. And this, not only the Venezuelan people, or of course not only the Venezuelan government, but not even the Venezuelan people can do it. It has to be done by all. And we ask for your um, cooperation and your help in order to stop and to make your government change this decision. It's not easy, but it might happen. Dialogue. Is the solution in Venezuela? Yes, it is. And we are looking for dialogue. President Maduro has conveyed dialogue since 2014. I'm not exaggerating the figure. Publicly, because privately even more, at least 500 times publicly. No? And this year probably 100 times out of these 500. <laughs> we are sitting down already. Our, our delegation, the government delegation, for national dialogue is waiting for the opposition to sit down and to find a constitutional um, solution to this juncture and to any other juncture. Because it is dialogue, the main tool that democracies have to use. And we know that they are behind the sanctions and behind the blockade and behind they attend these meetings in order to invade Venezuela. But they are Venezuelans and we have to sit down with them in order to find and to agree solutions to help our people. But they are not willing to sit down with us. They have said it. They deny any kind of dialogue. I know that some countries, I'm sorry, some parties within the opposition want dialogue. But there is a dictatorship of the White House or, or, or Bolton or whomever in the opposition. So they are controlled, especially because the chain of command is something like this. It's the corporations, no? The transnational corporations that want the Venezuelan oil and the Venezuelan wealth. Then it's the government of the United States. It's President Trump, Vice President Pence, um, <laughs> this advisor, John Bolton, this uh, um, uh, the Secretary of State, Pompeo, then some congressmen and women, but essentially Marco Rubio and this man from the uh, Florida state. Then it's President Duque in Colombia and some other presidents in Latin America. And then it's this man called Juan Guaido. But he has control over the opposition. And being him part of the chain of command, he receives direct orders. So he WhatsApps with Bolton. No? And with Pence, and you know, he, and uh, Mr. Julio Borges, who, who's a very dangerous man, who's even behind the assassination attempt against President Maduro, he goes to uh, meetings with Vice President Pence on a monthly basis, and they have direct. So the opposition parties that want dialogue to protect their unity, that this unitary strategy, they and they can't do it. If they do it, they will. I mean. Uh, they wouldn't kill him, right? That would be an exaggeration. But they would expel them from the opposition. They would be sanctioned by the United States if they asked for dialogue with this uh, uh, Maduro regime. No? No? You, Mr. Bolton tweeted yesterday about me. Because I, yesterday was an important day in the United Nations. You know, we declared that the, all the... Uh, April the 24th is going to be the day of multilateralism and diplomacy of peace. That is important at this moment when unilateralism, when hegemonism from the United States is trying to impose all the decisions all over the, the world. 
that is important. And of course, when I'm used to this, when I began to my, my address, my statement, then there's some diplomats from Peru, um, Argentina, Chile, Canada, they stand up and they leave. But that was the news, no? He stayed alone. It's, it's like if 13 countries is more than 180, uh, no, the, 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 what you 180 countries. Yeah? But, and, and Bolton tweeted about that. No? And uh, the, the, what did, if you can find the tweet, Bolton yesterday. And he, they tweet all the time. The, the Twitter is their main um, weapon at the moment, at the moment. Uh, uh, when we're talking the communication um, warfare. But the worst weapon are these sanctions against my people. It's, how do you say? It, it's this blockade, these sanctions are weapons of mass destruction. They never found them on Iran, on, in, on Iraq, in Iraq, but they're using them against Venezuela, no? and against Cuba, and against Iran and against uh, over 40 countries in the world. No, it's, it's many, uh, there's a big part of this story that, he, that we don't even know. Countries in Africa, countries in Asia that are also sanctioned by the United States. Huh? Ah, yes, it's the same pattern as in Chile in, in 1972-71. So, that is what we really ask for in the here. You, wh what you're doing it already. Uh, what's, what you're doing here, what you've done, the rallies that we've seen in Washington, in New York, it's so important, but keep on. We have to stop this from happening. And we even want dialogue with the, the government of the United States, whomever is the president. Uh, um, it would be, I know that if President Trump, if he was if he had the information, at least part of the real information, of the true, then maybe he would want to meet with President Maduro. Most of the issues would be solved at that level. Because, I mean, apart from him and what he believes in and how he, is, he behaves, um, the information he gets from Bolton, from Marco Rubio, from the, the, the Borges, from these people, it's, I mean, if, if, if we believe that the CNN and, and the Fox News is bad for us or for you, uh, you cannot imagine what he hears from these people. So if they are willing to have some kind of dialogue with us, we are willing, we are already sitting down, waiting, oh, we can travel. President Maduro has to travel to Washington to meet with Trump, he will. If he has to go to Singapore, like uh, uh, when the, this uh, DPR's thing, then he would. So, but I believe that, because that is a difficult goal to, to fulfill, I believe that your strength in the streets, in the public opinion, writing articles, writing, um, making people understand these kind of reports you know, um, with facts of what's happening in Venezuela can stop not only the war but even the sanctions at some point. So I believe it can happen. Please count on us. You know, we, we will never surrender. You know? We are not allowed to surrender. <laughs> What, what happened in Libya to President Gaddafi was horrible. No? How they killed him. No? They lynched him. They lynched him. And uh, even, well, we, 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 I mean, Saddam Hussein was not our friend, but they found him in a hole. No? I believe that's, what, that's a version that we have heard, and then they, they, he was killed. But President Maduro is not going to be found in an underground hole. He's not going to be lynched. He would resist. And if he has to defend his life with a weapon, he will. But that is not what we want for our people. That is not what we want for our region. I can't imagine the 
outcomes, those are outcomes, real outcomes, of what would happen if the, there were an invasion in Venezuela, not only within the Venezuelan borders. This, could, this would go beyond the Venezuelan borders. There would be a, a war all over Latin America. Uh, they, they talk about a lot about the, Ven the Venezuelan migration. They would see migrants then. No? Five million Venezuelans would flee in a couple of days, and six million Colombians that live in Venezuela would also flee, and um, two million Europeans and two million Arabs that live in Venezuela. I mean, what would happen in the Caribbean? What would happen in Colombia? What would happen in, in our neighboring countries? That would be a catastrophe. That is not going to happen. We have to stop it. But we count on you as well. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think there's something that some of us have learned when we've traveled to Venezuela that leales siempre, and we commit to the message that you have shared with us, which is the message that the Venezuelan people have been sharing with us, that we will never betray the people of Venezuela. We will always stand with you in the struggle of the Venezuelan people. It is our struggle as well. When we hear these sanctions, when we hear about these children, when we hear about the suffering of the Venezuelan people, they're talking about our children, they're talking about our sisters, our brothers, our family. And we call on all of those who are here today to the organizations that are present in this room that there's only one logical step for us as responsible and conscious people in this country. We want to call for a meeting next Friday, May 3rd, right here at the People's Forum, 6 p.m., to form an anti-sanctions committee. <laughs> and we do so, again, because we are moved by the situation that our comrades in Venezuela are going through. And we don't see this as a space only for those who are in favor of the revolution or those who are only in favor of Comrade Maduro. But this is our possibility, our space to bring in all those who are against US intervention, all those who believe that using sanctions, that using food and medicine as a weapon of war mm -hmm. is something outdated and futile and does not belong in these huge times of, for humanity. So we encourage all of you to bring your friends, your organizations, your comrades into this space. As part of the ongoing resistance of people and movements and organizations in the United States, we actually wanted to share a message for you and the Venezuelan people from the folks who have been rightfully resisting from within the embassy. And we want to put them on the screen right now. This amazing collective <laughs> made up of several organizations has been courageously standing up for what's right. Some people have been threatening them with evicting them from this embassy, but I have to declare and say that that embassy is as much ours as it is the people of Venezuela. In fact, we feel as Bolivarian citizens as any Venezuelan does. Comrades, the floor is yours. Had an amazing few weeks here. Uh, the Venezuelan diplomats and the staff who were with us have been fantastic. Uh, we are sorry that we are not with them right now, uh, but we have formed an amazing collective of people here who have been really steadfast, doing beautiful work, uh, taking good care of the embassy, 
uh, cleaning, protecting, uh, leaving everything uh, as spotless as we can while we have dozens of people sleeping here. Uh, we know this is the patrimony of the Venezuelan people and we feel like we are honored guests and placeholders and that we will uh, stay here as long as possible. Uh, we hope the police don't come to evict us. Uh, we hope that there can be a better solution to that and we will resist and we will be in solidarity with the uh, government, the people of Venezuela, and against the illegality of this Trump administration. And we want you and the Venezuelan people to know that there are Americans who are determined to stand up, sit down, lie down, <laughs> do what it takes uh, to show our opposition to our government's intervention and to say that this embassy belongs to the elected government of Venezuela. Yes. But we do have a question for you, if we could. So we had heard that there were negotiations about the embassies and that in the uh, U.S. Embassy in Caracas, there was talk about having it under the protection of the Swiss Embassy, and there were talks with some countries here about a similar kind of situation. Could you let us know if those talks are continuing and if there's any possibility of that ha happening? Uh, yes. yes, of course. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are very honored. Uh, because you are protecting the Venezuelan territory, as we said, and patrimonial, as we said. And uh, please keep on doing it. It's important. It's really important for the Venezuelan people. You are an example to us, to all the Venezuelan people. You are an example to the American people as well. And Medea, as a matter of fact, yes, there are some negotiations the, uh, the United States chose, uh, they have an agreement with Switzerland. And we proposed also, um, we are negotiating with another country. This is something called the international relations, the protecting power. Uh, they, they, they agreed with Switzerland that Switzerland would protect their building and some of the um, uh, how do you say, trámites? Payments. The what? Mm. Yes, the paperwork, the transactions. But uh, this has, be, has to be accepted by the Venezuelan government. And uh, we've told them that once we have our negotiation done with the country that we are uh, negotiating with, then we would accept Switzerland and we would have, we would respect each other's properties and everything. But that's not going to happen this week or next week. It's going to take um, some more time. And uh, I hope really, Medea, that they don't dare to go to our building and uh, try to take control of our building as they did in the building here of the consulate in uh, New York and two um, also places, buildings in, in Washington of the, our military attache buildings. I hope they don't dare to do it with the former building of the embassy because if they did so, you know, there's like a rule, like a, I would say una norma, a principle, a norm in the international relations which is reciprocity. And, and, and their building in Caracas is much more bigger, important. <laughs> huh? And that, that's, that's something that we would have to evaluate, no? Because that is Venezuelan territory. And there is American territory or North American territory also in Caracas. So we hope that they are civilized, sensible, and they don't do crazy things against 
our building because then we would have to respond. So that, and we have told them, yes. no, we have told them this. So let's wait and see what happens. But in any case, you have our support, but also take, take care of yourselves. That two of our diplomats are with you at the moment, but take care of yourselves. Don't risk <laughs> your integrity, your lives. No, we are very proud of you, very honored that you are there. And uh, please keep on um, guarding our embassy, former embassy, but uh, of course, take care also. Gracias, Medea. Gracias, amigos, to all of you. Thank you, Medea. Thank you, resistors of the Embassy Protection Collective. We wanted to also give a chance if Samuel wanted to say a few words. He's always brilliant. Thank you. Uh, I, I will try to speak short, but first of all, let me show my deep appreciation and gratitude to you all there in Washington because you are risking your uh, integrity, physical integrity, and showing courage to all of us to defend Venezuela. And uh, first of all, let me say, I, I, go, I hope that this is recorded by someone, that you are there with our authorization. You are there because we invited you to be there. You are not protesting, you are celebrating. You see, it's, uh, it's, it's ridiculous that uh, we see, uh, we have seen um, over the last three months, uh, officials of this government taking more than $30 billion from our property, legal properties, not drug money, it's oil money, it's refineries, uh, assets, uh, bank accounts, we are do doing nothing illegal, we have worked hard for that, and it's our property, it's our people's property, they have taken $30 billion from us, they have taken billions of dollars all over the place in bank accounts, they have taken our consular building here in New York. They also took uh, our military attaché building in Washington, and they are threatening uh, the integrity of and the health and welfare of our people by uh, cutting off uh, our chances to buy medicines and food. They are threatening with the use of military force. They are breaking international law, the Charter of the United Nations, Article 2.4 and 2.7 explicitly forbid the threat of use of force, explicitly forbid the intervention in other um, countries' domestic affairs. They are breaking international law. They are also breaking even the Charter of the Organization of American States at Article 19 and Article 20. Uh, they establish clearly that it's against the law to apply or use uh, extortion measures against, against other uh, member states in order to extract political benefits. I mean, they are breaking the law all over the place, and then this afternoon someone says that you are breaking the law by sitting there in our property invited by us. And this is ridiculous. I mean, you are not breaking anything. You are celebrating Venezuelan presence in the United States. And it's an abomination to think that we can get at any point in time in a war. It's ridiculous. I mean, I'm speaking not only to you who are sitting here, I'm sitting, uh, speaking to everyone in this country. It's the most abhorrent uh, uh, idea that Venezuelans or Latin Americans and uh, US uh, citizens can get at any moment in time in a war. That's something that happened 200 years ago, 100 years ago, it cannot happen now. But there are so deranged minds that think that this is a possibility only to get Venezuelan oil. Because no one of you, no one of every single one of you who is in here, not even the policemen on the streets, not the marine in their barracks is getting one single drop of that oil, nothing. You're gonna put your blood, you're gonna put your flesh, and you're gonna get nothing from that oil. And we are gonna sacrifice our lives. My children live in Venezuela. They don't live with me here. I don't want my children being bombed by anyone. I don't want my family to be at risk by anyone. But then there are people who think that it's a kind of evil game that they can extract profit 
by threatening our families, your families as well, our families, this is a conflict that if we start this stupid conflict, it will last for generations. It's not one year, it's not a pushover, as they say, that in a couple of hours they will take Caracas and everybody will surrender. It's ridiculous. But the idea is, how can we stop this madness? This is the main reason. Listen, I have done very important things in my life I'm very proud of. Some others are not so proud, but there are very many things I'm very proud of. But one of the things, the most important things I have I am doing now in my life is trying to stop this crazy war. I mean, this is something so noble, so high, so important, so practical, so far from uh, ideals, I mean, fuzzy ideals, it's so, so, so concrete. Never in my life have done, I've been doing something such an, impor of so in, such an importance as this one. And my petition to you all is to join us in this effort to stop the American people, the US people, and the, the Venezuelan people, and the Latin American people to begin a stupid war. There is nothing more stupid than that. We don't hate you. I have family here. <laughs> this is stupid. And there are very many of you who have family there. And then we are not asking for walls, you see? We are not asking for the being, uh, 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 to send eyes to you in the middle of the night and take you out of your homes and put you in a plane and send you back home. You are not, we are not asking for anything like that. We welcome Americans in Venezuela. We have welcomed them for more than 100 years. We play baseball, you see? We dance all the music that you dance. We watch Star Wars. My children were watching Star Wars last night. I don't know if that's healthy, but they do. <laughs> I cannot stop them from doing those. So. So the idea, my, my point is it's so stupid that we think that we are enemies. And there are some crazy people at the top thinking that we are enemies. We cannot be enemies. This is the most stupid thing. You are Latinos living here. You are not going back. And you want your, this country, which is your country also, to not begin a stupid war with your relatives in Latin America because we are a family in Latin America, I'm sorry to say. I'm sorry, not sorry to say, I am happy to say. And, and my point is, how can we work on something concrete to stop this madness? This is really an abomination. It's against any healthy soul. And we have to do something practical. These uh, committees that you are uh, calling for, from, for the next week is something to do. But we, there are four areas, at least, that we can work. The information warfare we are under right now, something that has to be counteracted. We, the truth. We are not asking you to say that uh, we are the most uh, uh, perfect country in the world. We have so many troubles, but any trouble that we may, we may have is not worthy of a war. We need to stop that this stupid kind of hate speech. I mean, in order for you or for the rest of the American people to justify the war against us as Venezuelans, it's because there is such a dehumanizing process in the middle that make you think that it's worthy to kill us. That yes, we are not such a human beings as you, and we are sub subhumans that we can be bombed, and you will say, well done, job done. Our military is so strong, so strong, so powerful. We are so proud, make America great again, bombing Venezuela. This is the most stupid thing I can think of. But there are people shouting things like that. And my job, my calling in my life from now on is to stop this war from happening. And I please asking you to do the same. Let's work together, let's find, let's find ways to work together and to show appreciation, love. It's not cheesy what I'm trying to say here. Love for each other. Because it, this is the only thing that can save us all. Thank you. I see, it's, it's reminding me, I said four things and I just complicated yeah. so much. Okay, there are three more. Yeah. <laughs> the information warfare is one. Diplomacy is the other one. I am at this diplomatic front trying to stop uh, the US government to spike our challenges and to kick us from, out of, from, from the United Nations. You know why is that important? It's such an important thing because if we are kicked out of the United Nations, we will become a rogue state. And as a rogue state, they can bomb us. No one can justify or can complain that a rogue state is being bombed because they are saving our population from this rogue government and this crazy Maduro uh, killer. 
And then we need to work that front as well. The third front is the economic world, the economic front. We are under an economic and financial welfare, warfare. I mean, they are uh, waging a war of attrition, as uh, Manuel said, uh, it's a medieval kind of war, killing us by cutting every kind of uh, life support uh, uh, mean that we can use of. And, but the most, um, I can even kind of proper word for that, ab 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 abomination, abominable, is the only kind of thing, the, the, so ghastly thing that there is that in the process of killing Venezuelans, by these invisible means, which are not bullets, but uh, financial warfare, banks and ships used as bullets and killing innocent people because they are collective punishment. They are not killing what they think are the guilty ones. They are killing everyone in the middle. But in, the, in this process, they are making a profit. They are making themselves rich. They are taking this billion of dollars, and there are lawyers getting 30% cut of every bank account they can uh, put their hands on. I mean, they are, they are ba issuing waivers and licenses because there are so many rich bondholders, Venezuelan debt bondholders, that they were frozen and they couldn't get any money, they couldn't get any money from it. But then, with the high, friends in high places in the Trump administration, they are getting these waivers, and then they can be paid. So they can get money from Citgo. The money they are controlling now is no use to buy medicines for Venezuela that they are so concerned about, fake in a fake way. No, they are not using that money to buy medicines. They are using that money to pay their friends, their debts. So they are making billions of dollars right now with that Venezuelan money. So we need to stop this robbery and this pillage and theft and plunder that they are doing against the Venezuelan people. And then uh, the last thing is the proper, the actual war. I mean, there was a blackout in Venezuela two or three weeks ago, and it was a proper act of clandestine sabotage. I mean, we are clumsy, even, I may, even let me be even more candid with you. We are cl clumsy and we are even corrupt. We have some stupid corrupt bastards, Venezuelan, in our bureaucracy, stealing mm -hmm. and uh, damaging uh, our uh, power electricity grid and system. But we are not so stupid, but to, to do in the middle of this crisis, five days, one week blackout, one area of Venezuela under almost two weeks blackout, because we are so corrupt and nasty. That's stupid. I mean, that, that can never happen. But this is the kind of narrative is being thrown at you, and they want you to buy that stuff. Because we are, I mean, if we are so nasty, we need to be overthrown. I mean, we need to be killed. Every punishment uh, that is, uh, of course, the people themselves do have punished us even before that the Americans. We don't need the Americans to punish us. The Venezuelan people themselves, we have punished a long time ago. But what they do not tell you ever, I know you know, you know but what they don't tell you ever uh, publicly in this information warfare is that there is a true national spirit. We are proud of being Venezuelan. I mean, I love you, but I don't want to be a U.S. citizen. I never have a beg for a U.S. visa, and I want to die here. I have my own country. Let me be proud of myself. I mean, it's not illegal to do that. <laughs> what I am telling you to do is let's be proud of each other, and let's be friendly with each other, and let's work this out in a, in a civilized manner. But they never even envisage the idea that we want to be independent, we want to commit our own mistakes, make our own mistakes, we want to be left alone in our political independence, and that is a human right, you see? And this military war, which is the fall, I said the information war, the uh, diplomatic war, the economic war, and plunder and pillage, and then the actual Cold, hot war with bullets and bombs and the rest, they are planning for it right now. I mean, they, they don't care, they threat uh, the, our people. We have never been threatened over the last 100 years by any power as we are being now, right now. And this is hurtful. And we have a national pride, we have a national spirit, we are proud of being Venezuelan, we don't want to be pushed around, we don't want to be bullied, and uh, we need to defend ourselves. This is a natural right. The, 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 the right to defend our people, our territory, our integrity, our history, our families, this is our natural right, as you have your own natural right to defend ourselves. 
but let's stop people producing these devilish narratives that at the end, what they are at the bottom of it is hate. They are manufacturers of hate. They are using hate and greed to use us as cannon fodder to kill us and to make a profit in the process. And we need to stop that. This is one of the worst things I've ever seen in my whole life. And it's, it's a kind of nightmare that we are in now, that we are the subject of this kind of processes. And you don't need to be socialist, you don't need to be communist, you don't need to love Maduro, you may even hate Maduro, but you also are entitled to oppose war. Let's do that, let's oppose war, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presence with us tonight. You leave us with a lot of commitments that we will oppose war and all actions of US imperialism against our people, the people of Venezuela. Thank you everyone for assisting and have a good night.